if I can make a difference in one kid's life today, this story is worth telling. So I walked in and I told them. Parkland High School is and has always been a good school when it comes to preparing its students for life and its many pitfalls. With an effective counseling program, various presentations throughout the year on topics like drunk driving and drug slash alcohol abuse, the school is no stranger to addressing real problems that students today face. In May of the past school year, Parkland was visited by Chris Herring, an ex-NBA All-Star who had everything and then lost it due to crippling drug addiction. Since getting sober, he has put on a program traveling to schools and addressing these issues with the people they hurt the most, students. He travels to hundreds of schools each year and, as a result, has an extremely tight schedule. As he entered the school, Parkland Profile was afforded a few minutes to get an interview. Despite some audio problems and a very tight schedule, Jesus Alvarado from PMN was on the scene to conduct an interview with Chris, covering the day's hot topics drugs and addiction. Hi Chris, well it's a pleasure to have you today. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come out and talking with us today. Uh, I have a few questions for you if you don't mind, um, so let's get straight to it. Athletes and everyone in general can be overprescribed when injured. This is a big problem in high schools nationwide. The problem isn't necessarily with the drugs attained, but it is with what it could potentially lead to. What are your thoughts on the gateway drug theory? Well, I think there's, there are many gateway drugs. I mean, I think drinking in the woods is a gateway drug. I think smoking pot on the way to school is a gateway drug. I think prescription medication is something that you have to take very serious because it can kill you. Right. Um, I mean, it's the number one cause of accidental death in America now is prescription overdose. It's uh, very true. You know, it... it beat out drunk driving for the first time for deaths amongst teenagers in, in years. Um, every 19 minutes someone dies because of it. So to look at prescriptions as a gateway drug, I think it's much more severe than that. Um, you know, there's kids out there who get prescribed medication and, and I have no problem or issue with that as long as they're taking it as prescribed. Mm -hmm. I understand. So how do you feel about the drug reforms happening today, such as the legalization of marijuana? I think the legalization of marijuana is reckless. I think it's, it's going to set us back. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that if there's 25 million drug addicts in America, I think that number will spike to 40 million um, right. in, in a 20-year period because everybody starts by smoking weed, yeah. you know? Um, it seems like it's becoming more popular. Um, of course, it's medical you know, mm -hmm. uh, purposes, but... At the same well, time. medicinal is different. I mean, if they legalize it and, and, and um, you know, for, for everybody to, to have access to it, yeah. um, I just think, I think you kids, I think kids have enough to deal with. I think the social pressures, social media, um, trying to to uh, compete uh, academically, athletically, and socially throughout these four years, as well as middle school. Um, it's hard, and, and kids fall back on substances as a way of, of, as an escape. Right, okay. Do you think that if you had been forced to receive treatment on uh, earlier, like in high school, uh, that your life would be different? I'm not sure. Um, I'll tell you one thing, though. I wish people emphasized more um, the pride of, of being yourself and not taking the easy road out mm -hmm. and, and jumping out into the woods and getting wasted on weekends. Yeah. Um, that became the culture and part of high school when I was there. Um, you know, I, I wish that we put more emphasis on wellness for kids and that you know, it's, there's something special about the kid who doesn't have to change. That's true. I agree with the widespread be belief that God's greatest gift to us is hope, as you've uh, also mentioned. Whenever we hit those walls, we always look to something to keep us moving forward. What's the one thing that drives you throughout your whole journey? My faith is the number one um, factor in my recovery. 
you know, obviously my family. Um, I have great friends. I surround myself with people who are just like me. And, uh, and every day we wake up to strive to, to get another day under our belt. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how you live. You know, you live one day at a time. You take 24 hours at a time and, and you win that day. And, and I've been able to do that with my faith, with my friends, with my family for the last, you know, almost seven years. That's very, very, very great. Um, I have a couple of friends who I actually still talk to from middle school, but I have to say I can never see myself married to someone from seventh grade. <laughs> <laughs> it's truly amazing how you met your wife in the summer of your sixth grade year. Uh, would you, where would you be today uh, if you weren't with somebody like that by your side? My wife is obviously, she's the star of the whole story. Um, yeah. You know, we've, I've known Heather, uh, our kids are now older. Uh, two of our children are older um, today than when we met. So it's kind of uh, special to, to see that and, uh, mm -hmm. and to know that. But she, uh, she stuck by me when everyone else told her to run. Um, and, and I thank God for that every day because... I'm not sure if I would have had it in me to continue if I lost, if I lost my family. Right, I completely understand. Mm. Um, you've mentioned that yeah, she, she comes with you sometimes mm -hmm. to these presentations. She's not with us uh, here today, but is, is that a usual thing then? You know, my kids, you know, with four children, and I mentioned to you that my niece lives with us, um, you know, the various ages, 16 to six, it's really hard for her to travel. Um, and to leave our kids, you know, with babysitters. So we're not big babysitter family type people or nanny right. type people. So um, if she travels, they all travel pretty much. We all go together, so. I see, okay. I have one last question for you today then. What's the most impactful thing that has happened to you when speaking to different high schools? Oof. That's good timing. I spoke at a suburban school um, in Chicago, maybe eight weeks ago. Okay. And a little boy walked up to me after and he was crying and he was 16. Um, I hugged the kid and we talked and I took a picture with him and he posted it on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday they found him hanging from a tree in a park. He killed himself yesterday. Um, I have that picture. Um, you know, the kids have been sending it out to me over the last 24 hours because at 16 years old, he ended his life. He was 152 days sober, I believe, when I met him. Um, but the depression got the best of him. Wow. That is very rough. You know, and there's a lot of good stories. Um, but I deal with a lot of the bad. Um, you know, those are the ones that hit home the most. You know, anytime on Mother's Day, mm -hmm. a mom has to get called to the park to see her son hanging from a tree, you know. Yeah. Well, you've also been an inspiration for a lot of people too, though. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you, brother. And I thank you a lot too for coming out yeah. and spending this time with us. Thank you for this interview. No worries, no worries. All good. Following the interview, Chris went on to give an amazing speech that hit home for a lot of people in the crowd. He went on to speak personally then with the basketball team, further emphasizing his message about the unnecessary and dangerous nature of drugs and the importance of being comfortable in your own skin. It was during this time that he introduced Brittany Sulat. Brittany first met Chris at a similar presentation years ago. She had experienced an extremely difficult life at home and turned to drugs at a very young age. She began smoking in elementary school and was using heroin by middle school. With Chris's help, Brittany turned her life around and is now working on her degree in college, while most people her age only graduated high school this year. Such a turnaround is a huge deal, making her a massive inspiration to all those who have suffered with similar problems. After Chris left, we got a chance to sit down with Brittany and have a conversation about her struggle and recovery. Oh, all right, well, um, I'm Brittany. 18 years old. 
Um, from Burnville, PA, originally from Hapro, and I have two years, five months, and some odd days clean. So I hear that you're going to be attending at Penn State University. What made you choose Penn State? Um, well, I'm going to go to Penn State Berks, which mm -hmm. is community college. It's not the main campus, but it's actually a couple minutes from my house, and I hear like they have a good program for substance abuse counseling, so I might do my master's degree there. Haven't really decided yet, haven't committed, but I think that's where I'm going to go. So what do you plan to do with your degree? Uh, I want to do things differently and so when I started getting clean my counselors they weren't in recovery like they didn't I feel like they judged me and they didn't understand like how could you talk to someone and get help from someone when they have never been there they've never been in that rock bottom so I want to take my story and be a counselor for substance abuse and like tell kids it's okay if you're 16 it's okay if you're 14 18 whatever it might be you're never too young. Like, you don't have to be like those 30 year olds that are now just getting it at age 30. So that's what I want to do with it. And then I want to also open an adolescent halfway house because there's nowhere for adolescents to go. They go back to high school and they wonder why they didn't stay clean or they wonder why they died or you know what I mean? So, but there's only one in Illinois and I was actually supposed to go there after treatment, but it's too far from home. There would, I would, wouldn't really succeed out there because I don't have a support group, nothing. So that's what I want to do with it. Okay, so now I think we're going to um, start at the beginning. So um, how old were you when you started using drugs? When I started using, I was seven, is when I picked up my first drug. And that was marijuana, mm -hmm. pot. And were there any like reasons or what was going through your mind when you There started? was. Um, my family was really weird. You know, I had parents, but they were married, um, but they divorced when I was three. And from that point on, it just, my family situation got really weird. And when my mom, when I was five, my mom got in a different relationship and uh, this guy introduced her to methamphetamines. And so on top of that, my mom is bipolar and schizophrenia and she stopped taking her medication. So from the meth and her mental disabilities, she started physically abusing me. But from that point on, like I didn't, I never was hugged by my mom, never was kissed by my mom, never was tucked in. So like I didn't know what a bedtime story was. And so at the age of five, I couldn't smile, I couldn't laugh. Like even like cartoon, like SpongeBob would be on and like a funny joke would come and I wouldn't laugh. It just, I felt wrong laughing because I was so upset. And so I always hung around older kids. And one day by age of seven, you know, soccer was not enough. Like, at seven years old, you get happy over a scooter, a bicycle, whatever it might be, but it wasn't enough. I just wasn't happy. So I was walking in my apartment complex, and the, my older friends, I knew the smell of it because my mom used it, and her fiance at the time used it as well. And all I saw was the kids in a circle smoking pot, and I saw laughter and smiles, and that's what I wanted. If I knew, if they were getting that off of that, I wanted that, whatever it was. So I went and chased it at seven years old. And like, they were all like trouble, like, cause that was my nickname. And they're like, this is so funny. But after that, I was hooked because I couldn't, I was numbing my feelings. So when I would go home to my mom and she would abuse me, it didn't affect me cause I was high. And I was able to laugh, but I didn't know it was gonna lead into nine years, nine years of using and picking up heroin at 10 years old. You know, it's, so it's crazy how fast it went. And like, I have addiction in my family and I was hooked instantly. You know, like pot isn't physically addicting, but it was for me and it's also mentally addicting. And that's what I do every single day was smoking pot at seven years old and it started from there. Do you think that's the reason why so many people struggle with drug addiction is because they feel something like you felt and they just want to numb their pain? I, growing up, I thought you had to come from a bad past to use, but that's not the case. Like, it's, that's so textbook. Everyone, it's like they think you have to come from a bad past to use, but in my opinion, it's not. You can be in high school and like your friends start doing it. So it's an experiment. You're trying it out. You're trying, you're going to those parties, having a sip of beer, and all of a sudden, like in your head, your endorphins, it's like they're saying, I like this. But your experiment is no longer experiment, it's addiction. So like some of my friends who I used to hang out with, the weekend parties, some of the kids would stop at the weekend. Sunday night when that comes, they'd sober up to go to school Monday. 
but my friends, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, was all using. So it can become an addiction with that. You know, you don't have to come from a bad past. Anything can get you, and like eventually, like you like it so much, you want more and more and more, like shoes. You know, like two years ago, Toms were very popular. You had every color. Same thing with drugs. Like once you find it and you start liking it, you want more, and eventually, like it makes your life unmanageable. So you did drugs for a very long time. Why do you think you did drugs for such a long time? Um, I couldn't stop. I lived with my mom from 5 to 14. And when I was 14, I had an intervention. I was, in, I was getting off of detention from school freshman year. And my grandparents, who I lived with, said, you know, we're going to go to Lowe's and get a pot for grandma. I'm think, I didn't think anything of it because my grandma was, like, was into gardening and everything, so I'm like, all right, that's normal. We passed Lowe's, and I said, we passed it, and they said, we're going to Doylestown for an intervention. And I, I said every curse word in the book at them. I was so pissed off because growing up, that's all I knew. From seven years old, you know, I couldn't tell you my favorite color. I couldn't tell you my favorite sports team, but I could tell you my favorite drug, and that's, that's messed up to say. So I was scared, what is life gonna be like without using? And I was scared not to, I was scared to feel my mom's pain again. Like I have permanent damage to this day because of what she's done. Like my jaw is, is dislocated. I don't have feeling on this side. And I would numb and numb and numb my body. But then it's, it's crazy in a way when I say this, but when I was 14 and I got away from my mom, I moved in with my grandparents. And they're a loving family. They, they hug me, they tell me they love me. And from my mom, I didn't feel worthy enough of their love and support. And I still used two years later, so I was 16. And I just couldn't stop. It's a monster. That's addiction. It gets you. And you go through withdrawal. And then through those years, I lost all sense of hope. You know, the light at the tunnel, they say. I couldn't find it. I really couldn't. All I could, does that mess up? It's okay. It's okay. All I could find was another bag. Waking up, not being able to know what I did last night, or waking up with a needle in my arm. I didn't, that was my life, was addiction. That's how like, I felt somewhat normal. I could talk to you, hi, as anything. I could play soccer, hi. But sober, I didn't know, I felt awkward. I'm an awkward person, because I like making things awkward because I feel comfortable. Does that answer your question? So, yes. Um, you said that you still struggled with your addiction after you went, after your grandparents gave you an intervention. Why do you think that intervention wasn't successful? I was scared to give up the drugs, you know. So at 14, it was seven years of using it. Four years of using heroin every single day. Like, I couldn't imagine what I would do without it. As soon as I wake up, I get high. To get a shower, I get high. After shower, I get high. Eat my breakfast, I get high. Everything was getting high. And so what my counselor did when I was 14 is she gave me a piece of paper and she said, write down everything you do during your day. And um, so I wrote my list down of like my daily agenda. And she said, erase everything. <laughs> she said, erase everything that's associated with, being, with getting high. My paper was blank when I erased everything because everything I do was getting high. So I didn't know, I was really scared. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to surrender is what we say in the program of surrendering. I just, I didn't know what to do. So I stuck with it, but it was the hardest two years of my life from 14 to 16. So I felt guilty every single time I handed in a dirty test of a drug test, you know, and I knew it was going to be dirty. I, I tried coming up with ways to cheat the system so I didn't fail my drug test or smuggling in pee, put in between your legs or whatever in a, in a bag. It's disgusting, but I didn't want to go away, you know? So you do everything you can to not give it up or not get caught. Uh, you said that you started out using drugs like marijuana and then going to harder drugs like heroin. How was that process? Do you believe in the process of the gateway drugs? Of pot being a gateway drug? Mm -hmm. That's a hard question. And I don't want to advocate that pot is a gateway drug, and I don't want to say it's, it's not. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm going to speak personally on for me, pot got boring. It wasn't enough, you know. And, and, also, pot is expensive. 
is $20 a bag, where a bag of heroin is $5. So a kid who doesn't have a job, that was for me. And I experimented with other drugs as I, from seven to 10. But after a while, it was just, it was boring. You know, it wasn't numbing my pain anymore. I had to smoke more to get to that first high. And you'll never get your first high. I don't know why, but you just don't. So as I said, it's $20. I was buying eighths of marijuana, 60 bucks. And multiple times of that. So I would be spending over $100 on pot. And it, I couldn't realize, you know, why am I wasting all this money for something that's not giving me that crunch anymore? I could still feel my mom's pain. I could still feel the pain in myself. And my friend was like, listen, like I have this hard thing. It's harder. It'll numb you like really good. Here it is. And I said, what is it? And she said, it's heroin. And I always said I would never do it. I always said I would never put a needle in my arm, but I, I did. It just like was like that, it happened. And I didn't think anything of it. I didn't second guess it. I didn't say like, oh, this could make me die. I wanted it because it just made me feel good. What was the final factor? What finally influenced you to get clean? I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Using is like a full-time job. You gotta figure out where it is. No matter if you've got all these people on your side who are willing to deal to you at any minute, you have to figure out how to get there. And you gotta figure out in school. So for me, I was in high school. I had to figure out how to fake the teachers that I wasn't high. And they knew I had like this reputation, whether I put it in cookies, marijuana and cookies, I still got caught. Whether it's tripping over an extension cord in the classroom, they knew I was high. And so there's so much work that goes into it and eventually you become sloppy and you can't keep up with your cover anymore. And I was tired of using. And I just knew after being in and out of intensive outpatient 10 different times, something, something wasn't right, something wasn't working. And in the program there's this saying, um, it says, doing the same thing, expecting different results. I had to do something different to get different results. And that's what I got. And I know that you, when you were in high school, you saw Chris Heron's presentation mm -hmm. and that really affected you. What was so effective about his presentation? Honestly, two years back, two and a half years back, not much, not much. Because at the time I was withdrawing. I mean, he was inspiring, don't get me wrong. But I would have never went up there if it wasn't for my superintendent of the district, Dr. Griffin. He made me go up there and say, you were gonna tell him you were seven years old when you started using. You are gonna tell him you were 10 years old when you started using heroin and that you're still on heroin and how much you struggle. And all the kids in my high school, I was known as the biggest dope fiend. I was, I was you know, leaning against the wall in high school to get to my next class, crawling on the floor because I'm so sick. There was this one teacher who would hide me in her room throwing up because I, I had to go to school. I was in trouble with truancy. Um, so I said that to him and instantly he gave me a hug and something clicked in my head. This is it. This is your different result you're talking about. Not doing the same thing. And I don't know how it really went down. I was on a 22 day suspension, like I said, and I don't know if my school was working with him at the time during those 22 days, but we went on a little walk that wasn't really a walk after um, he spoke to the public. And you know, he said, listen, I can send you to treatment. Do you want help? And the first time in my life from 14 to 16, I finally said yes. Like I just, I put my hands up and I surrendered because I knew if I didn't get it now, I would be like those 30 year olds getting it no kids or maybe having kids and they're in a dysfunctional family. I didn't want to be like my parents, struggling, getting kicked out of apartments, losing cars, $20,000 in debt. So I said, yeah, I'll accept your help. And in a day and a half, not even, pretty much overnight, he knew where I was going. He sent me to care and treatment centers in Warnersville. The next day he spoke to the kids like we just did now. And um, rumors went everywhere. Like, oh, this is the Project Purple Kid. You know, this is, everyone couldn't believe it that me, like I was getting help and that Brittany Sulot accepted help for the first time in her life. And then January 10th, I went to Karen for three months and that was that. 
And what has helped you stay clean for the past two years? Getting in service. And what that means is you have a home group in a 12-step program. I'm open. I go to Narcotics Anonymous. I don't have anything against if people go to AA or CA, OA. No matter what program you go to, it's all the same. The steps are the same. It's just maybe, you know, like admitting we are powerless over drugs. For AA, it's alcohol. You know, so they just switch words around. But after you get a year of sobriety, recovery, whatever you want to call it, you can get in service through H&I, which is hospitals and institutions. And through that service, I was able to do the Bucks County Youth Detention Center and bringing meetings to them. And it kept me clean because, yeah, you have a home group, you make coffee, you can, um, you can clean up the cigarette butts, you can set up the meeting, but a metal chair doesn't say thank you. These kids at the detention center were thanking me for bringing them a meeting, getting them out of their rooms for an hour and letting them talk about their problems. So that kept me clean. And then after a while, certain things came into my life where, you know, for school, I have to stay clean. During my internship, I had to stay clean. I got drug tested on random. And eventually, I don't want to go back to that. You know, I could easily get high right now. But what I do know is I don't have another recovery. And to answer your question further on what made me stay clean, it was the last week of treatment in Karen. And I was making reservations. I was plotting to get high again. After three months of like starting to love myself, I was able to look in the mirror again and accept what I see after three months. And I was about to throw it all away. But I had this dream where my great grandparents like were in my room and my duffel bags were on the ground and they snapped their fingers and we ended up in the cemetery. So all as I saw in my dream was my great-grandfather's dream, my, I mean, my great-grandfather's grave, my great-grandmom's grave, and then next to hers was mine. And I knew I had to stop. I couldn't, I had to be honest, I was making these reservations with my counselor because I knew, you know, like I said, I have another run in me, but I don't have another recovery because I've been through this so many times. And for some reason, no matter how much abstinence has it has been, I will pick up where I left off. If I were to pick up today where I left off on using, I would die right then and there. And throughout my two years of recovery, I've been to 14 funerals of my friends. Good kids, you know, like one time, it's one and done, a lot of them. And I didn't want to be like that. I didn't, I wanted to break statistics that I don't have to be six feet under. I wanted to be an inspiration for kids. Like it doesn't matter. You don't have to be like that talk about it and who cares like people are going to judge you people still judge me like oh my god you're on heroin like I can't imagine there's no way of looking that you are like yeah like tattoos I think you're an addict but some of my I've been in the program for four years now I've met doctors your doctor is could be in recovery so there's no image that you have to be to be an addict or an alcoholic what advice would you have for kids that are currently dealing with addiction and substance abuse? Get honest. You're, you're only going to hurt yourself if you're not honest, you know, and, and stop making excuses. And what I mean by that is when I was in my addiction, I'd always say, you know, it's because of my mom I'm still using. When in reality, it didn't do anything to her. It was affecting me, my life. You know, I had to quit soccer. I had to drop out of school. I couldn't, I couldn't graduate with my class. I, I couldn't go to a lot of things because I was high. I can't go in certain stores because I messed it all up. So if you get honest, it'll help you. And getting a support group, you know, it's like, I'm a visual person, so in treatment, I learned like this visual thing of what addiction looks like. And so it's you in the middle. And there's people around you and they represent like your mom, your dad, your friends, your meetings and your sponsor and step work. All right, so you stop doing step work, the circle gets smaller. You stop going to meetings, the circle gets smaller. And on the outside of the circle is addiction. It's really just a person. And it, it was scary for me to see what it was look like. So it's you and I sitting like your addiction. That I don't like you that close if you're addiction. Like I want you far away. And so, but what I also learned is that in high school, Monday and Friday are the hardest days of the week. Monday, you hear about the party that happened over the weekend. Friday, you're about to hear, you're gonna hear the party that happened. So I always avoided, I didn't go to school those two days. I'm not saying do that because you get in trouble and you miss class, so. But the thing is, be different. 
you know, if you see someone getting high, like someone, I remember my head was down because I was really hurting. And this random girl, I don't know her name, I don't remember much, but she was like, why don't you smile? And then like first time I'm like, wow, like people really see me. Like I thought I was invisible because I was just, no one wanted to be with me, no one. They were like, this kid is not going anywhere. And just to confront your friends. And I don't condone snitching, I really don't, but I know someone who snitched on their best friend and now he has five years clean. To his parents, snitch. I really, I personally would never snitch, but if it meant I could save my friend's life, I would in a heartbeat. I would go to their parents and I would say, listen, your kid is doing this, 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 this. I just did it the other week, you know, my friend from the program, his daughter, is going to those raves that it's now popular. It wasn't really popular when I was around. And she's Papa Molly, and she's only 17 years old. And he thinks like, oh, she's a straight A student, has her own business, like there's nothing wrong with her. And I said, listen, like I see your daughter on Facebook, this is what's going on. And he thanked me because now he's confronted her daughter, or his daughter, and she's now in treatment because she actually had a problem and she was putting on Facebook hoping someone would say something. And that's what I did. I'm not saying I saved her life, but I'm, I snitched to potentially save her life and get the help that she needs. What advice would you give to people who have maybe a friend or a relative that is dealing with addiction? Um, like I said, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. When I was really wrapped up in my addiction. My friend, we used to have like hearts of hearts in random parking lots and she'd be crying because like she's my best friend and she's like, you know, they called me sloth in high school, I will admit that because I'm really slow, but I was also high, but like I don't like walking fast. So she would say like sloth, like I'm so concerned about you. What are you doing with your life? Like you keep on using, you have like track marks all over your arms and you would never know because I have them tattooed so you can't see them. But um, knowing someone cared, because I couldn't care about myself. So they always say in the program, let me love you till you love yourself. That's what she said. And eventually, like, I started realizing, like, all these people really do care. You know, because I always thought, like, don't you ever wonder, like, what would happen if you were dead for a day? Like, who would be at your funeral? I don't, I don't need to experience that. I know people care, even if I don't know them. It's amazing how close a school can get when someone passes away because you support each other. And that's what you have to do. You have to support them and just go towards that cliff and take the risk of confronting them. They might hate you. They really do. They really, they might curse you out because they're pissed off that you snitch. But eventually, as time goes on, they'll come back and thank you for saving their lives and making them realize like, hey, like you really do have a problem. How has your recovery process helped you have a better view of yourself? Step work, and, and you do that with a sponsor. I couldn't tell you, even when I first got clean in treatment, I had to fill out like this little questionnaire of like what my favorite color was, what my favorite food was. I couldn't answer one question. And so like when you start dating, they're like, you know, guys, like what are you like doing? I don't know. I couldn't answer one question. And so through step work, I started figuring out like who I was. Oh, uh, sorry. I okay. started figuring out like who I was and what coming over problems and everything like in, in step four, that's huge. It's resentments and fear and abuse. And you talk about it and, and the most important steps, I think, is one through three. If you have a good foundation of steps one through three and you probably don't even know what I'm talking about, it's probably going over your head. No offense to you, but it's really complicated to know what it means. But steps one through three is about surrendering and getting a belief of, of I don't want to say God because I'm not religious and I have no problems with people that are. I have a higher power of my understanding. Um, but steps one through three, it's like the foundation. If you, it's like the cement to your feet. If you get a good foundation, you probably won't relapse, probably. But you always, you always will have that monster on your back. Um, but step work has helped me realize who I am and it's helped me in recovery. Like I've been really struggling lately of like contemplating on leaving the program because it's repetitive. And I, I get nervous because I'm the youngest one there. I came in when I was 14 and there's people, there are 30, 40, you know, tattoos, bikers, whatever it might be, moms, dads. And I'm like, I can't relate to anybody. 
but I may not relate to their personal life, but what I can relate to is that we're both addicts in recovery, trying to get another day clean. My time now, two years, five months, that means nothing. I'm doing the same thing someone is doing right now with one day clean, that's trying to get another minute, another hour, another day. Because if I let that time get to my head, like, oh, Britt, you have two years, let's go test the waters, that's what my disease does. It wants me to go get high, so I don't do that. I don't test the waters, like, why test it if they're calm, you know? So yeah. Okay, and uh, one of my last questions is going to be, what are some of your future goals? My future goals? Obviously to get another day clean, that's my future goals, but I can answer that, but I can't really answer that because I live in today. And too many times I've thought about the next day, where am I going to get the next one? So I like to think in today, but I'll answer it anyways. Um, I want to graduate college, you know, I have a 3.98, after this class I have a 4.0 in college. That's insane. Because in high school I had zeros and 19 percents and they said I wasn't going to go anywhere, but now I have a 4.0, well 3.98, like that says something. So I want to go graduate obviously, get a, hopefully set up an adolescent halfway house, be the best counselor I can be and just help people. I could have the worst day, and if you say, like, I helped you or I've, I'm working on helping you, it's a good day. And, and more so, if I don't use, it's a great day. It could, be, it could be raining four feet of snow outside, and if I didn't pick up, it wasn't that bad of a day because that's just how my life is. I mean, I guess the only thing I would say is I wish schools would take that risk in saying they have kids who are on drugs, but this is what we're going to do about it. I mean, so many schools, like my old high school, yeah, they have a reputation of being heroin high, but what do they do about it? Nothing. They turn their heads as if they don't know, and by them turning their heads, they wonder why multiple people have died. That's my problem. Like, I feel like they should do something about it and say, like, yeah, who cares? We have addicts, but we're going to help them do this. We're going to help them do that instead of suspending them. Like, I get it. It's a consequence. You have drugs on school grounds, but what does suspending them do? except hurt them even more because now they have nothing. There's all that time during the day that they can go get high and, and go do their thing and it does nothing. I, I hate it. If I could be a principal, I would do things differently. I really would. I would say, yeah, we have kids, you know, Chris Heron, he might speak for a day and it's going to be powerful. Your school is going to be different for a couple of days, but then after, let's say next week, it's going to go back to normal because people are going to be like, they're going to forget about it because during the weekend they're going to go party. Some of them will, some of them won't. And, but they should just do things differently. So yeah. Chris and Brittany's stories are incredibly impactful for a reason. A lot of pressure is put on students in academics, sports, and social life in general. Many students in Parkland at the forefront of these areas feel this pressure every day, giving Chris's words a lot of meaning. With all this in mind, we are moving in the right direction. Schools are finally facing the issues of drugs and alcohol and their prevalence where students are put under high pressure head on. By not ignoring these problems, we as a society can do more to help them. This is, after all, the point of school, to educate, prepare, and help to build a better tomorrow.